There's an experiment they did one time with dogs. They put them in a room, and the floor in which they would lie down had an electric current running through it, so no matter where they lay down, they would get a shock. And they would move around trying to find a spot where there was no electric current, and finally they gave up. And they would just lie down anywhere. And then they moved them to another room where half the flooring would give them a shock and the other half wouldn't. And the researchers would drag the dogs from one side to the other to show them that they did not have to lie down on the part that was giving the shock. But by that time they had given up. They figured there was nothing they could do. They just put up with whatever they had to put up with it. It's called learned helplessness. The creepy part about this experiment was that they did it as part of an experiment to show what torture can do. The fact that there's somebody thinking of these things is pretty creepy. But it does point out an important psychological lesson, that if you give up your sense of agency, then life is pretty hopeless. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha said that conviction is a strength. conviction of the Buddha's awakening, because the whole message of the awakening was that it is possible to follow a path that leads to the end of suffering. Through our own efforts, we can make a difference by our decisions. And you live in a world where somebody's done that. And if you can make that part of your identity, then you have a healthy sense of self. It's the beginning of a healthy sense of self. So you want to nurture that. It's one of the things we assume as we sit down to meditate, that we can make a difference. The fact that we're sitting here with our eyes closed, watching our breath, is a choice that we made. We're trying to see if it's a good choice, because that's a lot of what agency is. You make a choice, and then you test it, and then you learn from your choices. But it has to start with that assumption that you do have the power of choice. And you do have the power to gauge the results of your actions. So try to apply that here, because this conviction is not only a strength. The Buddha lists it as an internal treasure. It's a form of wealth. And when he compares the practice to a fortress, where all the different elements of the practice are forms of protection, conviction comes right at the beginning. It's the foundation post for the fortress. So think about that, the implications of the fact that the Buddha gained awakening. And as he said, it didn't come from any special divine powers. It came from powers within his mind that everybody has in potential form, simply that he developed those powers to the ultimate degree. This is one of the reasons why we chant about taking refuge in the Buddha. It means that we see his awakening as an important event, one of the events that shapes world history. It's not just simply a list of things that happened in the past that you can remember or forget and it doesn't make much of a difference. This is one of those events that has a huge implication for what you can do. When you think about the Buddha, it's a little bit superhuman for you. Well, you can think about the Sangha and the Theragata and the Therigata. There are lots of verses about monks and nuns who got really discouraged in their practice. Some of them were even suicidal. But they managed to pull themselves together. And the thought that's encouraged is that if they can do it, you can do it too. This may be one of the reasons why those verses were included in the canon to begin with to show sure that this is not a path only for superhuman beings. It's for beings who are very human. So try to think about the implications of that, and then apply them to what you're doing. That it does make a difference when the mind is wandering off, that you bring it right back. And even though it wanders off again, that doesn't mean you've failed. You just bring it back again. Learn to develop this as a new habit. You're developing good qualities in the mind. 
Mindfulness, the ability to keep your breath in mind. Alertness, the ability to watch what you're doing while you're doing it, to see what results you're getting. And then ardency, the ability to put in some effort to do this well. And you're going to have your ups and downs. But you learn how to talk to yourself. The Buddha himself, you can think about all the discouraging things that happen in his practice. Six years of austerities, and then the realization that it was a wrong path. A lot of people would have given up. Either that or they would have just stuck with the austerities and taken pride in the fact that they could be more austere than other people. But the Buddha was wiser than that. He said, okay, this was a mistake. Here's another path. And his willingness to learn from his mistakes was what made him Buddha. This is an interesting religion. It's unlike other religions that are supposedly founded by divine beings who have never known imperfection. The Buddha started out imperfect, made mistakes, and he admitted his mistakes. You can imagine Genesis. After seven days, God makes the world and they look at it and say, whoops, beings eating other beings. What kind of world is this? The Buddha recognized his mistakes. He looked for ways not to repeat them. This is what it means to assume agency, that your actions really do make a difference. You can unlearn your helplessness. It's a strength. It's a protection. It's a form of wealth. So apply these principles right now. The Buddha says it's possible to breathe in ways that give rise to a sense of fullness, rapture even, a sense of ease and pleasure in the body. We'll explore that. I know in my own case, after having tried different types of meditation where I was forced to just be with the breath, whatever it's going to do, and limit my awareness only to the tip of my nose or the upper lip, coming across the John Lee's instructions, where you're allowed to focus anywhere in the body and to breathe in any way that you liked, so long as it was comfortable, felt good for the body, good for the mind. Because comfortable sometimes means energizing, sometimes it means relaxing. Sometimes it means having a sense that the body is being very solid. Sometimes it has this meaning of thinking the body is being very porous. What would feel good right now? What way of breathing would actually induce feelings that would feel good? You've got a whole hour here to explore and experiment, because that's the essence of developing meditation as a skill is that you explore. You take the basic principles and see what you can do with them. When you read in Method 2, the, the text says to breathe, start with the breath coming in from the back of the neck, going down the spine. And talks about other ways of thinking of the breath energy going through the body. Well, it turns out that Ajahn Lee would also recommend other ways in some of his other Dharma talks. In other words, he gives you some ideas to start with, and then you can run with them. And then you can start running in the opposite direction see what happens. This is how you learn. This is how you develop your sense of agency and responsibility, seeing that, yes, you can make a difference, and if you're really observant, you can make a good difference. And if things aren't going well, you can use your ingenuity to figure out what might be a better way to breathe, a better way to focus. This is all allowed. In fact, it's encouraged. The Buddha didn't want us simply to recite his teachings and accept them, even for us to use them as tools 
for exploring our own minds to see what potentials there are there. As he said, everyone has within them the potential to find something that's deathless. Think about that, deathless, something that's outside of space and time. And it can be found right here, if you look carefully. And you start out by looking carefully at what you're doing and the results you're getting, and then refining what you're doing as a, as a result on the basis of what you've learned. So as we go for total liberation, it doesn't mean that we beat down the mind, put it through a meat grinder or a straitjacket, restrict its activities. You're going to be using your whole heart and your whole mind. If you want to find total release, and it starts with strength of conviction. So think about the implications of what it means that you're in a world where someone has gained awakening and has taught the way, what it means about your potentials, the potentials in the world, and see how it makes you a stronger person, a better person, a happier person. Because these changes can be made.